Good morning, gentlemen. This year is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and the centenary of the birth of Frank Thompson, an old Wiccanist. I would like to thank Mr Shuttleworth for inviting me to talk to you today about Major Frank Thompson, one of the Wiccanists killed in the Second World War, whose name features on the wall of War Cloister. Thompson came into college in September 1933. He made an immediate impression. Mr Wright, the master in college, told his parents their son was odd. He throws his head about, has trouble fastening his Winchester wing collar and bow tie, and blurts out odd remarks. He is no good at ball games. So Mr Wright suggested rowing to discipline Thompson's restless, nervous energy. Thompson was accident-prone and broke furniture. His peers noticed his clumsiness and the fact that he had a stammer. He got into a scrape on his arrival, writing a letter to a fellow dragon, his old prep school, who had gone to Eton. Unfortunately, the boy shared the same name as the new provost of Eton, Elliot, and the letter was misdirected. Thompson had inquired, How are you getting on in that hellhole of Eton? The new provost was not amused. Thompson received a dressing down from the Reverend Petrie, Winchester's headmaster. Thompson got into flights with Dancy, one of his peers, and knocked out one of his teeth. Dancy said, We weren't kind to each other. All that mattered was coming top and winning prizes. Thompson and Dancy would mark each other on the roll over their time at Winchester. In March 1933, the Times newspaper carried a report by Donald McLaughlin of the burning of the German Parliament, the Reichstag. George Dimitrov, the exiled Bulgarian representative of the communist Comintern in Berlin, was falsely accused of responsibility and put on trial in Leipzig in the autumn. D.N. Pritt, an old Wickhamist barrister and Labour MP, was tasked with investigating the allegations against Dimitrov and completely exonerated him of the charges. Thompson and the other boys in college followed the trial in the Times. Dimitrov successfully conducted his own defence, fencing with Hermann Goering, Hitler's sidekick. But at that time, Thompson was not much interested in politics. Botany, after philology, was his first love. He had a love of the English countryside. One of the first things he did at Winchester was to join the Natural History Society. One day he cycled up to hills, where seeing his first man orchid sent him into a state of ecstasy. Natural beauty moved him to write poetry. He loved the serenity of water meadows in April on his long, long Sunday afternoon walks by the Itchen and would rhapsodise about the loveliness of an English spring. Blackthorn symbolised for him the light-hearted strength and cleanliness of spirit, which was one of England's best features. Thompson described his early years in college as life's Elizabethan age, when, like Bacon, he took all knowledge to be his province and would stagger out of library under a pile of books. But it was the business of language which was the only one he began to understand. As well as classical Greek and Latin, Thompson undertook French and German. And then, in 1936, Sir Bernard Pears, director of the School of Slavonic Studies at London University, visited the school and in his peroration urged, everyone who can should learn Russian. Donald McLaughlin, now a modern languages master at Winchester, 
undertook to teach a small, non-extracurricular class. Thompson described Russian as a sad, powerful language that flows off the tongue like molten gold. He weighed straight in on the literature, reading Turgenev's Virgin Soil, about the 19th century Narodnik to the people movement in Russia, in which city students would travel to the country to meet the peasantry and attempt to radicalise them politically. Thompson described volunteering at Winchester's Crown Club Mission Youth Club for deprived boys in East London as fun. In July 1936, General Franco staged a coup d'etat with the help of Mussolini, the Italian dictator, against the Spanish government. And many left-wing young people went to Spain to offer humanitarian assistance or to join the international brigades in the fighting. Two of Thompson's neighbours from Boar's Hill, Oxford, Noel and Anthony Carrot, went and before leaving tried to persuade Thompson to join the Communist Party. He declined. Although the previous year, in the Winchester mock election, in which Robert Conquest stood as a Communist candidate, Thompson had shaved his eyebrows, hoping they would grow back bushy to make him look like Stalin, the Russian dictator, and had worn red scarves and danced round chamber court with a clenched fist, crying Red Front. The boys treated the whole event as a joke, but Conquest notched up a sizeable vote and was narrowly defeated by the Conservative candidate. Thompson was acquiring a reputation as an actor and joined the Shakespeare and Glee play-reading society, whose membership was only by invitation. He would play the role of St Peter in Murder in the Cathedral, and also read roles in King Lear. He had absorbed Macbeth's sceptical line, Tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. In college, Thompson, at 15, had acquired the nickname Monster Caliban, a character in Shakespeare's The Tempest, because of his large size and impetuous and ungainly movements. According to one college friend, Andrew Boyd, Thompson played up his natural clumsiness and grew to make a comedy of it. Thompson, who wanted to be loved, had discovered there is no one we love more than the butt of our friendly laughter. At Winchester, Thompson fell in love with the beauty of college's ancient 14th century medieval buildings, the hall, chapel and cloisters. In 1935, he won the Hawkins Prize for Archaeology and Architecture with an essay on ancient Greek architecture. He would call the Parthenon in Athens the most beautiful building in the world. He joined the Archaeological Society visit to see the Gothic abbeys and cathedrals of Normandy, as William Morris and T. E. Lawrence had done before him. In 1935, Thompson had also won the Gillespie Essay Prize for English Literature. Mr. Oakeshott set Mallory's Mort D'Arthur about the quest of the Knights of the Round Table for the Holy Grail, which could only be achieved by the most perfect knight, Sir Galahad, for the essay. Thompson absorbed the myths of the medieval troubadours and goliardic scholars. He empathised with the arch-poet's free-spirited verse, Hither and thither, Wandering through ways of air, prisoner of no king, birds like him bound by never a bond, masterless on ship and sea, questing go I for my kind. Thompson remarked the arch poet 
tore his short course through a life of wine, women and song, struck by poverty and a hacking cough. In his last two terms, Thompson gave a lecture on the ecclesiastical architecture and wood carving of Winchester Cathedral, and another on medieval scholars. He admired Eleanor of Aquitaine, who he said was responsible for commissioning the medieval literature of courteous love, having married first the King of France, then the King of England. Thompson admired the French philosopher Abelard, who brought reason into theological speculation against the opposition of Bernard of Clairvaux, who said there could be no compromise with faith. Abelard was sent into retirement, but he had won. By discrediting the church, Thompson said, he paved the way for the Reformation. At Thompson's final prayers at Easter 1938, Mr Wright read Loyola's favourite prayer. Teach us to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. During the singing of Domham, Thompson burst into tears. He made a resolution. When I die, I want to leave the world a better place. I don't know how, nor have I kept a resolution yet. He went on a grand tour during his gap term, starting near Salzburg at a student work camp, just as Hitler annexed Austria. Thompson wrote an apocalyptic apocalyptic poem on the extinction of Austria, saying, Not a cause, but an eon is dead. An age, not a nation, is plunged in the final darkness. He then travelled to Greece via Italy, where at the British school in Athens he was given an introduction to an old Wickhamist archaeologist, John Pendlebury, who was running a dig in the mountains of East Crete. Pendlebury warned Thompson that war was coming and that when it did, he would stand with the Cretan resistance against the German invaders. On his return to England, the Czech Sudeten crisis blew up and the Prime Minister, Chamberlain, flew to Munich where he agreed to the cession of the Sudetenland to Germany and was greeted on his return as the saviour of peace. He claimed he brought peace with honour. Thompson, seeing the writing on the wall, wore a black tie. Two weeks later there was a by-election in Oxford. Labour and the Liberals stood down their candidates in favour of the Master of Balliol, who stood as an independent progressive against the Munich Agreement. Thompson and his parents campaigned actively for Lindsay, who lost, but halved the Conservative majority. Thompson later remarked Lindsay would have done better to have taken the line from John Donne's meditation, Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, as his electoral slogan. Dejected, Thompson saw two choices, either abdicate politics or join the Communist Party. Instead, next term, Thompson threw himself into campaigning. He co-wrote and acted in the Labour Club play, It Might Happen Here. It was based on the 1936 American novel by Sinclair Lewis called It Can't Happen Here, which imagined a coup d'etat by a sitting American president. Thompson and a new friend Leo Pliatsky from Corpus imagined Oxford run from a concentration camp on Christchurch Meadow. At the after-play party, Thompson met Iris Murdoch, another classic student, whom he described as the dream girl. She had shoulder-length blonde hair. One of her close friends said of her, at Oxford she was so virginal. She reminded Thompson of Rossetti's picture of the dreamy damoiselle. And he would later say his ideal of womanhood was the Virgin Mary, 
to whom, like all the other boys at Winchester, he had been required to doff his hat to her statue over the entrance to college. Murdoch had joined the Communist Party when she arrived in Oxford, a conscience-ridden spectator, moved by the tragedy of the Spanish Civil War, and familiar with Auden's poem Spain, in which he spoke of the necessary murder. Although the two saw each other constantly, Murdoch at that time was only interested in a platonic friendship. Hitler, meanwhile, having annexed Austria and the Sudetenland, now had his eyes on Danzig. Thompson and Foote from New College acted as tellers in white tie and tails at the Oxford Union debate for the motion that this house will fight for Danzig. It was carried by a large majority. Thompson wrote to his Winchester friend Tony Forster, Don't get the idea Poland is a nice place. We may have to fight for it. That summer, Thompson threw himself into voluntary work, going to a camp for the unemployed in Wales, attending the Crown Club summer camp and attending a Communist Party summer school, which he described as a great beano. It was nice to hear a bit of idealism, since communism was a cold, mechanical creed. It was a tribute to Marxism that it could appeal to the uncontrolled romantic as well as the cold-blooded theorist. Events were moving fast, and summer bank holiday that year was August the 7th. The Thompson family held a council of war at their new home in the Buckinghamshire village of Bledlow in the Chilterns. Geoffrey Garrett, Thompson's father's best friend, who had read Hitler's Mein Kampf manifesto with its ambitions for German world domination in 1934, after Hitler had had several of his close associates murdered in the Night of the Long Knives, was there, along with Forster and Foote from Winchester Days and Thompson's younger brother. Garrett had exposed Mussolini's ferrying of Franco's army from Morocco to Spain at the start of the Spanish Civil War in his 1938 book, Mussolini's Roman Empire. It was reprinted several times. He warned that war was fast approaching. Thompson sent in his application to join the army three weeks later, three days before Hitler invaded Poland and Chamberlain declared war on Germany. The government had decreed that young men at university should stay there till they were 20 before being conscripted into the services. In the absence of his father in India, Thompson's mother, a forceful American and the disciplinarian in the family, moved to block her 19-year-old truant son's attempt to enlist. She rang up generals and the university authorities, to no avail. Thompson was adamant. As he would tell Murdoch, I simply wanted to fight. I know the evil things we're fighting. When Franco won the Spanish Civil War in the spring of 1939, Thompson had written another poem, Spain, saying free men had been murdered and enslaved. He knew that in April 1937, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, had bombed Guernica, the symbolic city of the Basques, and killed hundreds of people and injured many more. But the day after, Garrett, who was in Spain at the time, was flown back by the RAF to contest the Plymouth by-election. He warned the voters that their city was now in range of German bombers from Spain. They were deaf to his warnings and voted in the Conservative candidate. In the autumn, Thompson came down to Winchester for a prize-giving. His fellow classic, David Scott Malden, who had joined the RAF, flew his plane to Winchester and landed on Meadows. The two went for a drink and Thompson wrote a poem in Malden's honour. Recalling the goodness of grey stones and laughter, knowing how little either of us mattered, we found a kind of happiness, if not peace. Did you feel the passing of a shadow between the glasses, 
one will not return. As the island came to be in danger, Thompson's impressions grew more vivid. As battle raged at Dunkirk, he was on the South Downs, based at Eastbourne. He liked the scruffy, incoherent, endlessly good-humoured cockneys in his unit. You will never meet more refreshing and spontaneous cheerfulness and wit. They were a true dad's army, charging along the side of oat fields with masses of flowering cow parsley on their helmets. One night, as we were marching down honeysuckle lanes to a roadblock, some fool set the church bells ringing by mistake on one of the many false alarms. At Dunkirk, Phantom, the General Headquarters Liaison Intelligence Regiment, lost several officers. Their role? To liaise with foreign armies and to report action at the front line to headquarters. It required gifted young linguists. Thompson, with his French, German and Russian, was headhunted from the Royal Artillery. In August 1940, as the Battle of Britain broke out, his unit was at their headquarters in Richmond. As a bomb dropped on the building, Thompson was seated in the mess with a glass of whisky in his hand and was smoking his pipe. The force of the explosion catapulted him onto the floor and his pipe landed in the whisky, much to the amusement of Norman Redway and the others present. Thompson, ever restless, wanted action and was the only one of 50 officers in his regiment to volunteer for service in Greece. He frivolously remarked, I wanted a holiday. Churchill, now Prime Minister, had sent a phantom unit to liaise with the Greek army, then hurling back the Italian invasion from, Ab from Albania. As the Mediterranean was now closed to Allied shipping, the task force had to sail round the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. Thompson was shocked at the overcrowded slum conditions for the troops, compared with the officers' luxury and privilege. The only criterion of the war office in fixing a ship's quota of men was the amount of fresh water it could store. When the Labour Party won the 1945 election, it was said that troops' memories of wartime conditions had something to do with it. When the unit arrived in Egypt, German troops had already occupied Greece, so Phantom needed to find a new role, or it risked becoming a white elephant. Wavell, who Thompson described as his favourite general, another old Wickhamist, was the commander-in-chief of forces in the Middle East. He had said the modern soldier needed to be like a cat burglar, and sent Phantom off on a course in desert navigation. Soon after his arrival, Thompson bumped into Christopher Seaton Watson, who had played Jesus to his Peter in Murder in the Cathedral. Seaton Watson had escaped from Greece before the German invasion. The two of them were together on June the 22nd, 1941, when news came through of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. They both hoped Hitler would suffer the same fate as Napoleon in 1812 with his unsuccessful invasion of Russia. As education officer, Thompson had a responsibility for morale and giving the 80-man squadron a sense of purpose. He organised a war newspaper with cuttings from the press with news from all war fronts. In December 1941, the Japanese bombed the American fleet at Pearl Harbour in the Philippines, with the result that the USA declared war on Germany and Japan. Before he left for Egypt, Thompson told his brother he intended to become an American citizen after the war, as he got more homesick for America every day. Americans had warmth and vitality, unlike the English, whom he deemed too old and lifeless a people. Thompson wrote a favourable piece for the war newspaper entitled Salute to the Yanks. As their whole history had been a struggle against oppression, when they went for something, when they want something, they go for it with pep and drive. 
Thompson was appalled by the poverty of the towns in Egypt and thought that Islam did nothing to remedy it. The desert was the only good place. His squadron was involved in Operation Crusader in December 1941 to relieve the besieged Allied garrison in the Libyan town of Tobruk from the combined German and Italian forces under Rommel. Although Tobruk was relieved, Rommel later launched a successful counter-attack. By now, Thompson had a new role as maintenance and transport officer. Under the guidance of his Batman, 19-year-old Fusilier Lawton, a mechanic before the war, he was involved in tank and vehicle repair, an achievement for someone who was a rebel against this mechanical age and only passed his OTC Cert B at Oxford because he wore his old Wickhamist tie when all the examiners were either old Wickhamists or Etonians. The squadron had an assignment to work with the long-range desert group behind enemy lines. With his frivolous sense of humour, Thompson told Murdoch, the predominant masculinity was the most depressing feature of the desert, worse than flies, heat or sandstorm. He expressed his frustration in a short story, Gunner Perkins has spring fever. In everyone there was a longing for love and warmth, for closeness of mind and body, for giving and understanding. It was easy enough to have a rattle, but where does that get you? What one needs is a little feminine sympathy and a chance to reciprocate. But the two and a half years in the army had done him no end of good as his father, who had won the military cross for gallantry in World War I, rescuing the wounded under fire, had assured him. But he could never put his heart into it, the hand-to-mouth aimlessness, the lack of a continuous purpose, never a solid job which gave you the satisfaction of accomplishment. In the summer of 1942, the restless Thompson, who could not stand stagnation, thought of rejoining the artillery but the military setbacks in the desert meant there were no vacancies. However, in September 1942, General Maitland Wilson was given command of 9th Army, Pi Force, Persia and Iraq Force, and Thompson was appointed a captain and second in command. In June, in Aleppo, Thompson had visited Major Altunayan, an Armenian doctor friend of his parents at his home. In the party was another old Wickhamist, Captain Evans Pritchard, who was an anthropologist and fellow of Exeter College, Oxford, who had told Thompson, Winchester was the only school and turned out excellent seconds in command all over the empire, but never leaders. Thompson ruminated, I doubt I should ever have made a leader and never felt the urge to lead or command anyone. In Persia, the role of Phantom was to keep watch for any German invasion across the Caucasus Mountains and liaise with Russian soldiers who were there after the partition of the country in 1941 by Britain and the Soviet Union. Sir Stafford Cripps, another old Wickhamist, a left-wing Labour MP, had been expelled by the party for supporting the Popular Front in 1938. But Churchill appointed him as ambassador to Moscow in 1940 and he oversaw the supply of Allied military aid to the Soviet Union through Persia. But by the time he returned to England in 1942, he was disillusioned by his experiences of Stalin's regime. In and around Tehran, Thompson met both Russian and Polish troops, where he was gratified to be taken for a Polish or Russian officer, commenting, I must have a Slavonic face. He intended to make Slavdom his life's study, writing about Slavs, their history, lives and civilization, perhaps even straight journalism, if I could pay my way at it. His father, himself a freelance journalist, got a selection from his son's letters published in the New Statesman Weekly magazine. 
Thompson began to intensify his Russian studies. He met white Polish officers whom he found charming and eccentric and was shocked to read Polish nationalist newspapers demanding a return post-war to the frontiers of the old medieval Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Thompson was even more distressed when Polish officers during the bitter battle for Stalingrad told him that every Soviet soldier had a man behind him with a revolver pointed at his back to prevent desertions. When the following year 10,000 graves of Polish soldiers were found at Katyn, he could not believe that they had been murdered by the Russians, not the Germans. He also met a Polish ATS corporal called Miller. He gave her English lessons and practised his Polish with her. Having joined up to fight for Poland, he promised to give her dinner at the Hotel Europe in Warsaw in six months' time. Curiously, he told another girlfriend, Catherine Nicholson, Robert Graves' daughter, months before that he would marry a Polish ATS girl but hadn't yet met any. He felt compassion for Miller's fate, having been transported to Russia from Krakow to work on the roads. She had become separated from her family and did not know if they were still alive. She was alone and had nothing. This made him realise his own upbringing had been so comfortable that it shocked him how bleak life was for the majority of human beings. In December, his commanding officer, Major Grant, went off on a six-week course and 22-year-old Thompson took command of the 80-man squadron and not for the first time, had to give orders to seven officers whose average age was 30, which he found anomalous. To keep up morale, he gave the squadron a lecture on the status of the resistance in the different countries of occupied Europe. His plan had been to speak for an hour. His audience was still with him after two hours. His command of the subject and his enthusiastic delivery had held them spellbound. Continental Europe, which England understands so little, yet needs so much, and the reverse replies, was the one subject he never tired of. He optimistically imagined teaching all school children one of each of the three European language groups, Romance, Germanic and Slavonic, would promote the solidarity of Europe. He also, looking to the future, agreed with the socialist policymaker G. D. H. Cole that a European Union was the only alternative to the disaster of another war. The expat Greeks he had met in Egypt talked as if Greece were a member of the British Commonwealth, and he believed that after the war, if things went well, one might make a healthy Commonwealth out of Europe. After his nightmare of command, Thompson was sent on a course where he gave an enthusiastic talk on the coalition government's plans for post-war reconstruction, featuring the Beveridge Plan, which was to be Britain's attempt at an American-style New Deal, addressing the pre-war problems of poverty, unemployment, old age pensions, education and slum housing. The squadron was then involved in training for an Allied deception plan to invade the Greek Dodecanese islands occupied by the Germans. He boasted to his family, I wish you could see how fit I am. We run by the gibbous moon and bathe by sunrise, as good a way of living as many and better than most. The squadron then prepared for the invasion of Sicily on the 10th of July 1943. The Navy had made a balls up, so everyone landed on a different beach from that planned previously. As his landing craft came into shore, it was hit by mortar fire from coastal batteries. Thompson saw men on the beach having arms and legs shot off, but realising it was up to him to rally morale, he managed to get his troops ashore, exclaiming, Blackberries by Jove, and darted off to pick some. 
his troops followed him through a ravine. The unit received a good chit for its work in Sicily, and he, having mounted a successful anti-fascist demonstration with the locals, concluded. Freedom had gained a footing on the Sicilian coast, and Italians were saying in the streets what they really thought for the first time in 21 years. This day was as memorable as any in world history. We who were there, though tired, were pleasantly conscious of it. Eager to get to grips with another job, Thompson had applied to join the Special Operations Executive, started by the Prime Minister Churchill in 1940, to set Europe ablaze. Thompson had heard of it on the grapevine. In 1942, the Earl of Selborne, an old Wickhamist, became Minister for Economic Warfare with responsibility for SOE. Its London headquarters were in Baker Street, where another old Wickhamist, Bickham Sweet Escott, had oversight of Middle East operations. Thompson's plan was to join the Greek section. To train, he went off on a commando and parachute training course, where, after making five parachute jumps, one at night, he concluded, terror was not a paralysing thing. Every man must be tried. My own tempering has only just begun and I mean the process to be thorough. He enjoyed the comradeship of his fellow parachutists, who were keen on adventure, sharing a hatred for having life cut and dried before them, hating anything to be immutable, least of all their own selves, still having the power to surprise themselves. He started work in the SOE office in Rustum Buildings in Cairo. During 48 hours, he had to make conversation in Polish, Arabic, German, French and Italian and push them all to a successful conclusion. The net result was a certain amount of silent awe. However, when he discovered that the successes of the Republican Greek resistance movement, AM, working with Monty Woodhouse, now a colonel, for whom he had fagged in his first year in college, were being credited to their rival monarchist resistance movement EDES, Thompson balked and asked for a transfer. Hugh Seaton Watson, Christopher's older brother, for whom Thompson had also fagged in college, had unsuccessfully plotted revolution from the British Embassy in Belgrade in 1941 and was now at the SOE Balkan desk in Cairo. There was a vacancy for a mission to Bulgaria. With his Slavonic languages, he was well suited. He quickly took up boxing lessons and told his family he had the makings of a powerful thug. Although only 23, folks took him for 30. Many of the Bulgarian partisans were deserters from the Bulgarian armies policing Thrace and Macedonia, territories awarded to them by Hitler as the price of Bulgaria's Axis alliance in 1941. The partisans had taken refuge with Marshal Tito's Yugoslav partisans in German-occupied Serbia. They needed weapons to become an effective fighting force against their government. Since Bulgaria declared war on Great Britain in 1941, the British had had little information on the country, so missions were sent to investigate. Churchill demanded unconditional surrender. When the Bulgarian government refused, Churchill persuaded the Americans to bomb Sofia, which created a lot of damage and forced the government to evacuate the capital. Stalin sent in a mission by parachute, demanding that the partisans invade Bulgaria in May. Thompson sent in a sober assessment at the end of April. Don't expect a large-scale revolt by the army and people. The Bulgarians have been demoralised by 20 years of fascism. The partisan movement is too badly armed and scattered to be a nationwide force before the big day, so bomb to hasten collapse. Despite his reservations and those of the Yugoslavs, Thompson, in the absence of fresh instructions from Cairo, felt he had to go with the partisans. The result was a disaster. 
The mission was betrayed, captured, and Thompson denied prisoner of war status and executed on June 10th, 1944. Rather, as he had prophesied to another girlfriend, Desiree Cumberlege, in the summer of 1940, when he wrote, I must seek an early death at the age of 23 to preserve my fame intact. In 1940, Thompson, who believed the arts gave meaning and purpose to life, said Aeschylus Agamemnon towered over drama. Its hero was the Greek warrior Achilles, whose mother, a goddess, had told him he could either have a short life and fame or a long one and ignominy. Thompson's paternal uncle, Frank D. Thompson, for whom he was named, was shot by a sniper's bullet in World War I in Flanders at the age of 23. Thompson would say his ideal of manhood was the Greek god Apollo, who he saw as a rebel and a fighter. The Bulgarians who shot Thompson on Gestapo orders told his radio operator Kenneth Scott, as Thompson was with rebels, he was shot as a rebel. Scott, who reported Thompson had told him, before they were caught, let's find better organised partisans, received the DCM medal on Sweet Escott's recommendation. In 1945, Robert Conquest came to Bulgaria as press officer for the Allied Control Commission and persuaded the Bulgarians to organise a memorial ceremony attended by Thompson's mother and brother at his graveside. Thompson and the partisans shot with him had been reburied in a state funeral attended by 50,000 people. He was declared a national hero and acclaimed as the Byron of Bulgaria. In 1941, after hearing of Pendlebury's death, Thompson had written, His dearest ambition was to be the best-loved Englishman in Greece, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria or Old Muscovy. On August 15th, 1945, Victory Over Japan Day, his poem, Pelicity Meliora was the only one to be published in the London Times and for the 50th anniversary of VJ Day, Victory in Europe, in 1995. The poem was read by the screen actor Edward Fox in a sunset ceremony in Whitehall before the Queen and broadcast by the BBC to the world. The Voice of War anthology of World War II poetry described the poem as the most moving of the Second World War. It reads as follows. As one who gazing at a vista of beauty sees the clouds close in and turns his back in sorrow hearing the thunder clouds begin. So we, whose life was all before us, our hearts with sunlight filled, left in the hills our books and flowers, descended and were killed. Right on the stones, no words of sadness, only the gladness due, that we, who asked the most of living, knew how to give it to.